I first give honor to God and also to our pastor, Pastor Casper Quarter. We, who are we? Receive the word fellowship. And what do we do? Receive by the word. And why do we do? Wait a minute, y'all don't sound convinced. Who are who are we? To receive the word fellowship. And what do we do? Receive by the word. And why do we do it? To get the proceeds from the word. All right, and hopefully we'll be able to do that today. All right, so I have a question for everybody, but don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. How many of y'all have ever gone to bed without brushing your teeth? Hmm. Maybe you were really, really tired or you weren't feeling good and you said, forget them teeth, them teeth will be there in the morning. <laughs> and sure, that salmon with the lemon butter sauce and the garlic parmesan mashed potatoes, and no, I don't want to print that. Um, with the garlic parmesan mashed potatoes and that side salad with all the red onions and the feta and everything on it probably tasted delicious the night before but that next day after all of those flavors had been festering on your tongue all night not so much huh sounds a lot to me like a relationship gone sour I'm sure every one of us in this room has had some situation, some tiff with a coworker, a fallout with a family member or a friend that made you feel like you had a bad taste in your mouth. And that phrase, a bad taste in your mouth, is actually a really good description for a very common emotion that nobody likes to talk about. Who wants to guess what it is? I see all the wheels turning. It's fabulous. You're in the neighborhood. Anybody else want to give it a go? Unforgiveness. Y'all are on the street. I'm going to whoop him. Okay. Y'all want me to tell you what it is? Yes. This guy. Bitterness. This is a topic that I actually wrote about a few years ago for my blog, but lately, it just will not leave me alone. So I wanted to talk to you guys about it today and hopefully it'll help somebody, right? The interesting thing about bitterness is that it exists in the world and we know about it, but nobody wants to admit ever that it fits them, right? They'll tell you, I'm disappointed or I'm upset they might even tell you, I'll unplug their life support so I can charge my phone. But the minute you call them bitter, it's fighting words. And it makes people think that it's some rare condition that's only reserved for a certain type of person. But I beg to differ. And if I go one further, I would argue that we live in a society that borderline encourages it. Maybe not on purpose, but just a little bit, right? I'll prove it to you. If I go on the internet on any given day, the Facebook philosophers will tell me that as soon as somebody say something I don't like, or they offer a viewpoint that opposes mine, the answer is to cancel them. If I go over to Instagram, the IG therapists are gonna tell me that the solution to any conflict, great or small, is throw a block party and cut them folks off. Even worse yet, the TikTok Confuciuses have sometime, <laughs> will somehow try to convince me that forgiveness is wholly and utterly unnecessary. And it feels like we live in an era where people are perhaps the most invested in self-help and self-improvement than we have in a long time. And we have more access to resources, both qualified and not so qualified, than we have before. 
and you get all these messages saying, let go of everything that no longer serves you in the name of protecting your peace. But the question is, what has that profited us? What, what it is, has it gotten us? Well, on one hand, you do have people who are growing, but you also look around the world and you see people who are completely disillusioned with life. They're in broken fellowship with their friends and family. And a lot of people are even in broken relationship with God. All of that wisdom on the surface, it sounds great, but is it really godly? Well, I got good news for you. That answer is in the word and we're going to discover it together. So today our topic is don't chew the bay leaf, how to win the battle against bitterness. So I don't see any note takers, but if you're taking notes online, our text for today, the main one will be Ephesians chapter four, verses 25 through 27 and then skipping down to verse 31 and 32. So I'm going to be reading this in the, in the New American Standard Version of the Bible if you want to follow along or if your eyes are good and you can see it on the screen. I have it up here, so I'll give it a second. Get there. All right. So Ephesians chapter four, starting at verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not, or be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil opportunity. Jumping down to 31, all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander must be removed from you along with all malice. 32, be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. God bless the reading, the hearing, and the doing of that word. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word, for your love letter to us that you've given us to guide our direction, to know you more, and to keep us on the straight and narrow path, Lord, to you. I pray that as I share this message, that it will reach your people, that they would be edified and you would be glorified in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we saw in verse 31, just one of the four instances of the word bitterness as it is explicitly appearing in the Bible. But what exactly is bitterness? Okay. Bitterness from a sensory perspective, according to the Oxford Dictionaries, is sharpness of taste or lack of sweetness. We all understand that, right? But in an emotional context, bitterness is described as anger and disappointment at being treated unfairly or resentment. Now you may say, that's okay, that's natural. If somebody wrongs me or treats me unfairly, I'm going to be angry and I'm going to be disappointed. Pointed. That's natural. But I will go a little bit further and pull Miriam Webster's um, definition of bitterness. It goes on to say that it's marked by intensity and severity, and it involves intense animosity marked by cynicism and rancor. Psychology today goes on to note that bitterness refers to feelings of sadness, resentment, and anger, especially a anger, excuse me, that accumulates over time. So 
I would venture to say that the dividing factor between somebody just being a little mad in the moment and being bitter is that bitter requires a little more maintenance. It's like that wrong, that hurt, that pain that you experience, it lights the fire of anger inside of you, but bitterness throws logs on that fire to keep it going. So basically, at the point that you've become bitter, you've moved on from I just feel mad to I am committed to being so. It becomes a state of being, which kind of makes it dangerous. But why is bitterness so dangerous? There are a few reasons. I'll talk about just three of them today. So first and foremost, and perhaps most important, bitterness is a pathway that can lead you to sin. So there are a lot of underlying things that would make a person bitter. Like for instance, you may have been out of a job for a while and you're like struggling and you're just really, really disappointed at every rejection that you receive, right? But that on its, in itself isn't necessarily considered sin, right? But when that disappointment causes you to completely turn away from God, which is what happens to a lot of people, we're in trouble. I'm going to also give you another example in Acts chapter 8. So, there we go. So, when we read Acts chapter 8, we encounter Peter, who is talking to this guy named Simon, and he's admonishing him for a bunch of shenanigans that he's on, like trying to buy the Holy Spirit with money. And Peter basically tells him, your heart ain't right. So in Acts chapter eight, verse 23, Peter says, for I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of unrighteousness or iniquity, if you see this in the King James Version. And the thing about this verse, this instance of bitterness, if we were to look at the underlying Greek word here, which if anybody wants the Strong's number, it's G4088. This word actually translates or is defined as extreme wickedness. So that in itself is a bad look, right? But... If we dive into the scripture a little bit further, we find that bitterness can be accompanied by unforgiveness. Those two kind of like to skip down the street together, like holding hands. And the thing about it, Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 through 15. Hold on, not Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 through 15 says, For if you forgive other people for their offenses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive other people, then your Father will not forgive you of your, your offenses. So when that bitterness works in concert with unforgiveness, it can place you in an unrepentant state and to not be in right relationship with God. Furthermore, past just being mandated to forgive, we are also called to re resolution and to reconciliation. And I think this is a place where we struggle the most. It's easy to say, yeah, yeah, I forgive you, but... <laughs> then you have to go that extra mile. The Bible tells us in a bunch of different places that we are to actually pursue peace. So when we choose not to attempt the resolution, to attempt the reconciliation and to pursue that peace with our brethren, it puts us in disobedience 
to God and in misalignment with the character of God. So are y'all with me so far? We've established that bitterness is a pathway to sin. We don't want to give place to that. Another reason, bitterness is bondage. Bitterness has a tendency to keep you in a negative state for longer than you want to stay and sometimes take you farther than you want to go. That's given hostage situation to me, right? So a lot of times what it'll do at best, it'll hinder your relationship with God. It'll hinder your relationships with other people. It'll hamper your faith. Hey, it'll discourage you and keep you from pleasing the Lord. Also, having established come on in. reconciliation, y'all. <laughs> okay. So also having established in the last slide <laughs> that bitterness can lead you to sin, we have to understand that sin in and of itself is a form of bondage. We can look at John chapter 8, verses 34 through 36, and it simply tells us, Jesus answered them. These are the words of Jesus. Truly, truly, verily, verily, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. Now the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. Verse 36, so if the son sets you free, you will really be free or he is free indeed. <laughs> okay, so I just want to remind and encourage somebody that although bitterness is a form of bondage or sin is also a form of bondage, anything that is keeping you bound and keeping you from God is God's will that you be free. It's not his will that you be bound. He wants you to have liberty in him. So, yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> so number one, bitterness is a pathway to sin. Number two, bitterness is bondage. And number three, a bitter root can never produce sweet fruit. Who can tell me what Pastor Casper preached about last week? Reproducers. What? Very good. So we had our illustration where... We had our watermelon. Did it have seeds or not? It was seedless. And he illustrated that that seedless fruit was sterile and it couldn't produce any further fruit at all. But here's the kicker. We can make sure that we're producing seeds and that we're putting them on good ground. But we also have to be very cognizant of what kind of fruit that we are producing, seeds rather. That coffee plant, which happens to produce something bitter, can never give you mangoes. Job 4 and 8 tells us that you will reap what you sow. And likewise, I can't sow discord and expect to reap peace. That's very important for us in our personal lives. I want us to internalize that as a church and always keep that in mind. And at risk of getting in trouble, <laughs> for those of us, any of us that are parents, any of us that have any kind of influence on young people, that ground is fertile. We have to be very careful of what seeds we're sowing into them with our influence. Amen? Amen. Okay. So we've established that bitterness is dangerous. Pathway to sin, bondage, and producing unsweet fruit. So what can we do about it? It's a few things. First off, we got to learn to trust God. First and foremost, without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord anyway, but we got to learn how to exercise that faith and trust him. The thing about bitterness 
is so much of it comes from the enemy exploiting our desire to protect ourselves basically from further damage in order to keep us bound. That's what he wants. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy, right? So when experiencing pain and disappointment, our first instinct is going to be to do whatever we can do to never experience that ever, ever again. We choose not to trust. We choose not to forgive. And we absolutely choose never to forget. And all of that is human, but it's not necessarily righteous. It doesn't really reflect the Lord's attitude toward us. And we just touched a few slides ago on what the word says about forgiveness so that we may also be forgiven. But in Micah, it also tells us that God cast our sin away and forgets it. I would say God concerning our sin is forgetful by nature. So when we're handling um, that disappointment, handling that hurt, you can't just say, yeah, I forgive you. And yeah, I will try to reconcile and make peace and then keep bringing back that old thing that doesn't reflect the way God treats us. So just for fun, who is old enough to remember what these are? <laughs> OK, I see a lot of blanks. That's OK. These, my friends, are burglar bars. Ever heard of them? Oh, man. OK, so back in the day, especially the 90s, I don't know if they had them in certain other neighborhoods, but in our neighborhood where folks was like stealing stuff, you would put these bars on the windows. You probably seen them now, right? To keep folks from coming in and robbing your stuff. But do y'all know why they're not popular anymore? Yep. Folks houses were catching on fire and Exactly. They couldn't find the keys to let themselves out. So just as an, a warning, a related warning, the same burglar bars that you put up to keep people out are the same ones that keep you trapped inside when you're in trouble. That false sense of safety created by this type of self-preservation allows the enemy to keep you in prison. So keep that in mind when you are struggling to trust and struggling to be vulnerable and open yourself up to what and who God wants for you. OK. So we got to exercise wisdom. A lot of people will combat and say, what about wisdom? What about discernment? And what about guarding your heart and all this kind of stuff? Yeah, that's great. That's great. But ultimately, our focus is to do what God asks of us. We got to focus on doing what is righteous and honorable unto God and allow him to do the protecting that he promised. I could give you a litany of scriptures. I won't go into all of them. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your might. And in all your ways, acknowledge him, lean not to your own understanding, and he'll make your path straight. We just talked about Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? Romans 12 and 19. If you want a list, I can give them to you. Um, but ultimately, rather than focus on our distrust of people, our distrust of pathways, doors that are open for us, we got to trust God and let him do what he does best. All right. Amen. Another thing we can do. Not that, though. <laughs> Divest from your truth. Story time. OK, I had this friend. We're going to call her. Jamie, we're going to change the names to protect the innocent here. So Jamie was having a really hard time with a mutual acquaintance of ours. I'm going to call her Lee. 
I'm going to call her Lee. So Jamie called to talk. And y'all know when somebody, you can tell they just call into a um, vent. And so you exchange your niceties. Hey, how you doing? I hope you're doing well. Blah, 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 blah. And I quickly realized she just, she just coming to dump on me today. And so I just let her get it out. She started telling me about how Lee had wronged her, done something to upset her. So after I let her get it all out, oh no. Hopefully the camera is still on. After I let her get it out. Yep, we are. Okay, cool. And tell me all of her grievances. I encouraged her and I figured Jamie and Lee, they'll patch it all up. And eventually that would be the end of it. I ain't got to hear about this no more. Tell me why she called me again the next week. And this is after her and Lee had kind of had her come to Jesus and tried to hash it all out. And she was still talking the same stuff about what Lee had done to her. And it turned into this thing where like every time I talked to her, it was the same old thing. Even when Lee tried to offer olive branches and try to show some good faith, Jamie would find something wrong with it or some suspicion about it. So we would talk and she'd tell me and I'd try to talk some sense into Jamie. And she would always just bring that conversation back to what Lee had done to her. And over time, what I noticed is that her frustration and her resentment was growing. Going back to that building over time that we talked about at the beginning, Jamie was doing something that I like to call chewing the bay leaf. Brother Brian, will you take that bottle that's on the other side of my bag and make sure everybody gets one of those. Hopefully it's open already. So a lot of times when a person hurts you deeply, you get invested in that perception that you have of them. In this case, Jamie wasn't just mad at Lee anymore. Like she was committed and invested in feeling that kind of way or invested in believing that Lee was a horrible person. And it's easy sometimes when a hurt is especially deep to keep replaying that reel over and over again. It's like when you're scrolling through Instagram or TikTok and you click on a reel and maybe you get distracted and it plays. You got it? I'll get it. I Don't get crush it. him up now. <laughs> oh, he's got something. But yeah. <laughs> And why are you back there grab my water out of the refrigerator? But yeah, it's like they're real. They're plays over and over and over again. And you get distracted. And before you know it, you didn't hurt a million dollar baby like 50 times. <laughs> That's my jam. $50, million dollar baby 50 times in a row. It becomes background noise where you don't even notice it anymore. And that's comfortable, right? It's comfortable to continue to think negatively of a person versus doing the work and trying to have a different perspective. But is it productive is the question. Thank you. I know you didn't die on me. Hang on, folks. Oh. Did everybody get a leaf? Yes. Okay. All right. We'll just do this. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so 
back to the matter at hand. Is it even accurate? So I encourage you in your own free time to go back to Acts. There's a lot of good stuff, especially the story of Paul's conversion. He was Saul. He was a big, bad, bad, bad man who was running around persecuting everybody. And then he had an encounter with Jesus and it changed his whole life. He wrote a bunch of books of the Bible, presumably. And he went from being called Saul to assuming the name Paul. What I'm trying to say here is that some of us are still mad. <laughs> some of us are still mad at a Paul for something Saul did to them decades ago and Saul don't even exist, right? So the answer to this lies in Philippians 4 and 8. If anybody wants to know my favorite passage of scripture is Philippians chapter 4 verses 6 through 8. But verse 8 tells us, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, think about these things. If you really want to move forward like we just sang, you got to stop meditating on the negative and start meditating on what is actually true right now. Maybe that was true of that person. Maybe they were horrible back in the day. Hey, but if not anymore, stop meditating on that. You got to move on and focus on what's true, what is a good report, what is lovely, what's excellent, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> that. <laughs> and thirdly, not only do you got to forgive other people, you need to forgive yourself. Sometimes we have to ask ourselves, are we really angry at that person for what they did? Or are we really upset about what that person reflects within ourselves? Raise your hand or don't. How many of us have suffered a relationship or a job or some other situation that we probably should never have been in in the first place and got burned by it? Yeah, all of us. And the thing about it, the hurt that that other party caused is not our fault. That was their choice to do what they did. But we can't help but wish we never entertained that in the first place. It's hard not to guilt yourself about your part in it. And you need to be accountable. We all do. And that would be the right thing to do. Be accountable and then do what we just talked about. <laughs> Meditate on the positive, move forward. But it's much easier to stay mad at that other person forever. And prayerfully, that other person has grown and they no longer exist. Even if that's not the case, hopefully you have grown and you no longer exist in that space. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. We gotta let go of the old and let it die. And break. I'm getting there. Embrace the now and let both of those ghosts go in peace. Since you said that, a lot of times we want to let go and we want to let God or say that, but we don't really mean it. It's like, yeah, I let go, but let me hold on to this. Let me hold on to my guilt. Let me hold on to my shame. You can have everything else. He wants it all, y'all. He wants it on. So embrace the now and let both of those ghosts go in peace. Now, 
What about these leaves that I just handed you? How many of you all have ever seen or used one of those before? You have? Very, I figured you did. Yeah. So, bay leaves. In the culinary or sensory sense, there are five different basic tastes. Food can be sweet. Food can be salty, food can be sour, it can even be umami, or it can be bitter. Bay leaves, like the ones you have in your hand, fall into the bitter category. They're typically used in small doses to enhance other flavors in whatever dish that you are cooking. I like to drop mine in a sauce or in a soup and let them simmer for a while. And if you really want to draw the flavor out of that bay leaf, you drop it in a little bit of oil and you toast it. Y'all catch that later. <laughs> and under no circumstances should you ever take that bay leaf and chew on it. Because as you can see, I saw you sniffing it. Not only is the taste of a bay leaf by itself bitter, the smell is kind of pungent and the texture is really unsavory. Basically, that bay leaf is not fit for consumption, right? So that bay leaf is going to build depth of flavor in your food. Likewise, the Lord, you're going to have bitter experiences in life. That's life. Things are going to happen. You're going to have trials. You're going to have tribulations. But he can use those experiences to build depth of character in your life. He can use those experiences to grow your wisdom, to strengthen your faith, or even he can use it to show you yourself if you let him. But if we aren't careful, that bitterness, those experiences, if we allow them to make us bitter, it can overwhelm our entire life. Like if you were to have a bowl of soup and you got that bay leaf just sitting in it and then you eat that soup and you catch some of that bay leaf, it's going to make the entire bowl of soup unpalatable for you. Our bitterness can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Pardon my progress. Let me remember where I am. <laughs> <laughs> but the key is, once that bitterness has done its job, or shall I say those bitter experiences have done our job and those flavors or that character has matured in your life, the idea is to remove that leaf from the food. You got to let it go. If you find yourself today in a place where you've been convicted and you are bitter about something, you are unforgiving about something, you are in disobedience about something, something, a conflict that you need to resolve. Um, something he's calling you to do, but you've fallen out of trust with God, whatever that may be, I want you to pray. I want you to get from that situation what God wants to give, or better yet, give God what he's trying to get from you. Going back to what Raekwon just said, cast your cares upon Jesus. He cares for you. Give him that burden. Then I want you to taste and see that the Lord is good and let it go. Amen. Amen. All right. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you so, so very much for that word. I thank you for your, your power to heal, deliver, and set free and free us from the bonds of iniquity to free us from shame, to free us from guilt, 
to free us from pain and to hold our hand and protect us and keep us to uphold us with your righteous right hand as we navigate life, as we navigate disappointments, as we navigate any kind of conflict or trial, Lord. We won't fear because you are with us, Lord. Help us to lay aside every weight on this day, Lord, and run this race with patience. I thank you, O oh God, for this time that we have had, Lord, in worship and in fellowship. And I just pray even now for the gro growth, Lord, not just in number, but growth as people. I thank you, Lord, and I bless your holy name. Amen. Amen. Are there any? Oh, thank you. <laughs>